Okay. Good evening. I call this uh, study session of the Planning Commission of the City of San Clemente to order. Today is Wednesday, June 21st. Do we have a roll call? Commissioner Crandall? Here. Commissioner Davis? Here. Commissioner McCacken? Here. Commissioner Prescott Leffler? Uh, she is not present and she said she would be late, but uh, should be here for the Planning Commission meeting. Uh, Chair Pro Tem Camp? Here. Vice Chair Cosgrove? Here. And Chair McCann? Here. Thank you. Our topic for tonight's study session is the Secretary of Interior's Standards for Historic Property Rehabilitation. Do we have a presentation? Uh, yes, I can, I can introduce myself. I'll start my video here. My name is Amanda Duane. I'm a senior architectural historian at GPA Consulting. And the city has asked me here today to give you a quick refresher on the Secretary of the Interior standards and how they're applied. Uh, so if you don't mind, I will share my screen. Just one moment, please. Okay, thank you, sorry about that. Just getting all of my controls set up here. Um, so as I said, uh, I'm Amanda Duane. I'm an architectural historian with GP Consulting. We'll be going over the standards today. What we've done is we've broken up this presentation into three parts with a chance for questions at the end of each section. So um, if you have any questions, uh, we will have an opportunity to go over those before moving on to the next section. So the first section will just be a quick overview and background of the standards, what they are, why do they exist, and how they're used, as well as their application in analyzing project impacts to historical resources for CEQA. So the Secretary of the Interior Standards, their full name is the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. They were first issued by the National Park Service in the 1970s, and they've been revised and refined over time. The standards were most recently codified in 1995 in the Code of Federal Regulations, and they are the guiding principles for the treatment of historic properties. They were developed as part of the National Park Service duties delegated to them after the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 was passed. And it was part of a larger effort to establish and standardize a National Historic Preservation Program, largely in response to widespread redevelopment and infrastructure projects in the 1960s and 70s. So the standards include four different treatment options. There's preservation, restoration, reconstruction, and rehabilitation. And the standards for each of those four treatments consist of six to 10 brief statements and the statements, uh, the, the language of the statements, it's not prescriptive, prescriptive. It is intentionally broad in order to address a wide range of historic resource types and project types and reasons for significance. And since they are written so broadly, it is important to also remember that there are um, a lot of other publications from the National Park Service that accompany the standards that provide more detailed guidance on specific topics uh, including the guidelines for each of the four treatments, as well as the bulletins and briefs on different material types, features, and uh, project types. The choice of the treatment will depend on a variety of factors, including the property's historical significance, physical condition, proposed use, and so on. I uh, will just quickly go over the four. Uh, the preservation is kind of the lightest touch. It focuses on maintaining and repairing the existing historic materials and retention of the property's form, accepting that it has evolved over time. Restoration is a method of depicting a property at a particular period of time in its history 
and removing evidence of other periods, such as later alterations that are not considered significant. This is often done for interpretive purposes. Similarly, reconstruction is also a method often used for interpretive purposes, and it involves the recreation of uh, an entire historic property or just portions of a historic property uh, that have been lost over time uh, based on documentary evidence. But the most applicable for our purposes and the ones that you will encounter most often will be the rehabilitation standards. And rehabilitation offers the most flexibility. It acknowledges the need to alter or make compatible modifications to a historic property to allow for its continued or new use while retaining the property's historic character. The rehabilitation standards emphasize the protection of historic fabric but allow for replacement of deteriorated or damaged or missing materials, as well as planning compatible alterations to extend the useful life of the building, such as additions or upgrades to systems like HVAC and so forth. An excellent example of a rehabilitation project that you are no doubt familiar with is Casa Romantica in San Clemente. Uh, it's been adaptively reused multiple times, um, as you are well aware. Uh, it was first constructed as a residence, and it later became a senior care facility, an events center, a cultural center, educational facility. So it's, it's had a lot of different lives, um, but it still retains its historic character because those types of standards have been followed to introduce those new uses. As I mentioned briefly before, each of the four treatments has a set of accompanying guidelines, and these go into more detail about specific materials and features, such as windows and doors, and the surrounding site, and additions. Um, they also include, as time goes by, you know, more considerations about sustainability and resilience to natural hazards, as well as code required work. The guidelines are laid out. Uh, the language of them is recommended versus not recommended. So they'll have recommended treatments compared to not recommended treatments. And it's all very flexible and advisory. Um, they're not intended to be regulatory, but they are intended to cover a broad range of scenarios so that um, the, the you know infinite number of, of different projects and property types can be addressed using the same standards and guidelines. So now that we are acquainted with the standards themselves, the next thing that we will go over is how and why they are used. Federal agencies will use the standards and guidelines in carrying out their historic preservation responsibilities such as reviewing federal tax credit certification applications and applying the criteria of adverse effect under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. And uh, it has been adopted by, for this reason, it's been adopted by many local agencies as part of their project review process, uh, reviewing alterations and um, ensuring that local resources are preserved. And state and local officials also use them as lead agency while analyzing potential project impacts to historical resources under CEQA. Projects that comply with the standards are generally considered to be mitigated to a level of less than significant, and these projects may be eligible for a categorical exemption by following the standards. So when analyzing for impacts to historical resources, uh, there's some language from the uh, California Code of Regu Regulations that um, gives us a hint on, on how we can ensure that there are no impacts. Um, so projects that may cause a substantial adverse change in the significance of a historical resource may have a significant impact on the environment. A substantial adverse change is defined as physical demolition, destruction, relocation, or alteration of a resource uh, such that the significance would be materially impaired. And I'm you know, kind of moving down the ladder here. Uh, the significance is materially impaired when a project demolishes or alters in an adverse manner those physical characteristics of a historical resource that convey its historical significance and justify its inclusion in or eligibility for inclusion in, oh, excuse me, my slide changed, uh, the California Register or the local register. As I mentioned before, projects that follow the Secretary of the Interior standards are generally considered to be mitigated to a level of less than significant. 
and they may be consistent with a class one, class 31 categorical exemption. So the bottom line of all this when reviewing a project for compliance with the standards and potential impacts under CEQA is to determine whether the project will demolish or alter the physical characteristics of a historical resource to the degree that it would no longer be eligible for a listing or designation. So as a quick review of everything we just went over, the Secretary of the Interior Standards, uh, I'll probably just call them the standards now for short. Uh, they're organized into four different treatments. The most appropriate treatment depends on the historical significance of the property and a couple other factors, but rehabilitation is the most commonly used treatment. And when analyzing impacts to historical resources under CEQA, it's important to determine whether the project will demolish or alter the physical characteristics of the historical resource that justify its listing or eligibility for listing. And projects that comply with the standards are generally mitigated to a level of less than significant because the standards are there to guide the compatible alteration, the planning of a, a compatible project that retains the historic character of a resource. Uh, so the next section will be how to determine what those physical characteristics are. But I wanted to pause here and allow for any questions. Does anybody have any questions? One quick question. Uh, being that a lot of the historical properties have a different designation, either local, state, or federal, are the uh, guidelines applied equally for all of them or um, reduced for ones of less significance? Not necessarily. The standards will be applied um, evenly across all types, particularly for CEQA. Um, as the lead agency, the City of San Clemente will decide whether um, locally listed or um, California Register listed properties are considered historical resources for the purposes of CEQA, but they are all treated the same under uh, the, different, um, the different standards, if that makes sense. The, the application of the standards won't rely on the level of significance, federal, state, or local, but more the type of significance and how it's conveyed through the physical attributes of the resource. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay. Quick, quick question, Adam. Um, relative to questions from the public, um, is it our hope that we'll have time allowing at the end where the public can ask questions or, or, and or make comments? Uh, it's up to the commission as to how much public uh, comment they'd like to receive tonight. If there's time available and, and you'd like to hear from the public, then that can be made available. I, I don't know what the timing of the presentation is or how much time there may be at the end. Um, okay. So, so my suggestion, I don't know if I can get some nodding heads on the c commission, is time allowing, we would love to hear from the public mm -hmm. at the end. So if you have questions, jot them down, um, or, or, I don't know, questions and or comments. Um, and then, like I said, time allowing, we'd love to hear them at the end. Does that sound workable? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you, Amanda. If you could move on to section two. All right, thank you. So section two, we will focus on how to determine which physical characteristics of the historical resource uh, most convey the property's historic significance and which of those need to be retained as part of a project in order to comply with the standards and kind of moving down the line, um, avoid impacts under CEQA. So the best way to determine which physical characteristics of a historical resource are the most important and convey its significance and justify its designation or eligibility for designation in local or state registers is to get to know the resource. You want to understand why it's historic, what its character defining features are, and whether it retains integrity and what aspects of integrity it retains. So you, the first question is, is why is this historic? What context does it represent? Is it associated with commercial history in San Clemente? Is it an early residence of a prominent individual in San Clemente? There, there's lots of different reasons that something may be significant. 
And under each of those contexts, there may be a, a type of significance. And these are the different criteria for designation. So criteria A uh, for the National Register, one for California, and A again for San Clemente is very broadly, um, it has an important association with historic events or trends. Criterion B to B is an important association with significant persons. And criterion C, three or C is um, broadly designed. You know, it's architectural style, an example of a property type or embodying a period of construction or representing the work of a master. And that will be important later as we kind of step through the different um, different steps of this exercise. The next question is, what is the period of significance? And this is essentially the date or date range during which the important event or trend was occurring, or the date or date range that a property was associated with a significant person uh, for a building that is designated under criterion C. Uh, it's generally the date of construction. Um, and a resource may have more than one period of significance, so that's an important thing to know as well. The next step will be to identify what the character defining features of that property are. The character defining features are the physical attributes dating from a property's period of significance that taken together reflect its historic significance within the given context and theme. Preserving the character defining features will maintain the integrity of the resource and ensure that it is still able to convey its significance and its eligibility or listing in a register uh, will still be justified. Uh, so based on National Park Service guidance, there are three basic categories of character defining features. There is the overall visual character. This is big picture then exterior materials and craftsmanship, which are things that you would observe at a little bit closer range. And then interior spaces, features, and finishes um, deals with the, the inside of the building. So overall visual character, as I said, this is big picture. This is the setting, its location on the site. How does it relate to the other features on the site, such as landscaping or accessory buildings? What shape and size is it? What is the building plan? What is the roof form? How tall is it? Uh, what kind of projections or voids are on the building? Are there balconies? Are there arcades? And then the openings, you know, how many doors and windows are they? How, how are they arranged? What is their size and shape? So these are the, the, the first kind of big picture things to identify. And on the next couple of slides, we have some images that will the, you know, they're very different buildings, but they'll kind of il illustrate how even at a glance, you can get an idea of why a building might be significant. The next category of character defining features is exterior, ma exterior materials and craftsmanship. And these are things that you can observe, as I said, a little bit closer range. Um, what kind of materials are present? How are they applied? How do the windows and doors operate? Are there lots of decorative features or are there none at all? Um, are there, is there evidence of construction techniques like saw marks or fixtures or things like that? And I've got a few more slides here just to illustrate the idea of, of exterior materials and craftsmanship and the different types of things that you can observe as well as what they might convey. And the last category is the interior spaces, features, and finishes. Uh, these will be details on the inside of a building, such as the size and arrangement of spaces, public versus private spaces, how do they connect, what is the circulation, as well as the features and finishes of ceilings, walls, flooring, uh, permanent fixtures like lighting or mantelpieces, and uh, things like trim, you know, or is everything very well appointed or is it a little bit more plain? Got some more images here just to illustrate the concept. And the interior won't always be part of the project review process, particularly for residential projects. 
but this may become something to look at when um, reviewing projects that have maybe public interior spaces. And the next step in this exercise is to understand the relative importance of each feature. Some things to consider when assessing this is whether the feature is original, how visible is it? Does it display quality of design or craftsmanship? Is it directly related to the original design or use? Is it fully intact? Um, something like a historic firehouse, if it had a pole and a siren and things like that, those would be features that were related to its original use. And so those might be primary character defining features for that specific building. Things that would be less important to conveying or not at all important to conveying are those that might be non-original, things that have been changed over time, things that are less visible or you know meant to be seen less, like a rear elevation or a crawl space, uh, things that are common or utilitarian, um, like a, a fire escape sometimes can just be a plain fire escape and maybe that's not a, a primary character defining feature. Um, as well as things that have been, been altered from their original state. So taken all together, the character defining features contribute to the overall integrity of a resource. Um, this is another preservation topic that could probably have its own training session, but essentially it is a preservation term that um, relates to the ability of a property to convey its historic significance. Uh, it doesn't relate to structural integrity per se, so it's not to be conflated with condition, but more, you know, does this historic resource convey its historic associations? Um, so the National Park Service identifies seven different aspects of integrity. There's location, uh, so the original location of a building, the design, this relates to kind of the arrangement of features and how they can convey the original function or aesthetic of a building. The setting is, is similar to location, but it's more the, the character of that location. Is it very rural? Is it urban? Uh, things like that. And materials is a little self-explanatory. It's the, the historic fabric, the materials that were used in the construction of the resource. And workmanship relates to um, evidence of, of construction methods, whether it's you know very fine craftsmanship or something a little bit more rough and vernacular and feeling is it's a little bit more subjective but the integrity of feeling is you know does this feel like a farmhouse from the 1800s for example uh, an association is does this property convey its historic association under one of those criteria that we discussed earlier a resource does not need to retain all aspects of integrity in order to be eligible for listing. Uh, some aspects of integrity may be more essential for certain types of significance than others. Um, for example, resources that are significant for their association with events or trends, there may be more emphasis on aspects like location, design, feeling, and association. Um, it's not a very scientific test, but one way to think about it is, you know, would a historic contemporary recognize that building as it is today? Um, you know, if they lived there in the past and they were to see it today, would they would they recognize that building? Uh, whereas resources that are significant for their design, whether it's an architectural style, representation of a property type, or period of construction or work of a master, there's more emphasis on aspects of integrity like the design, materials, and workmanship, uh, but maybe not so much the location. And I also wanted to talk about historic districts um, because project view, review, you'll also be considering changes and compatibility to resources within historic districts. It's a little bit uh, different of an exercise, but for a district to retain integrity as a whole, the majority of the components that uh, make up the district must retain integrity. So if it contains so many altered components or intrusions that it no longer conveys its historic character, then it, it can't be, it's no longer eligible. Um, but when assessing those impacts and, and whether it will affect the ability of the district to convey that historic character, 
You might consider the location, the size, the scale, the design um, of those non-contributing elements. So if it's something maybe towards the edge, it may not have as much of an impact, but if it's right smack dab in the middle, uh, then it might be a little bit more intrusive. Um, for district contributors within the district, the integrity threshold may be a little bit less stringent, um, but if it's been substantially altered since the period of significance, it likely no longer contributes to the overall integrity of the district. And here's another place to pause and review and stop for questions. Um, the reason for this kind of exercise is to identify the character defining features and integrity of the historical resource. And to do that, you will need to understand the type and period of significance of the resource and understand that some character defining features are more integral than others. And the same is true for integrity. Uh, the essential aspects of integrity are those that are required for a specific property to convey its significance. So if a beautiful Victorian home is relocated to another neighborhood, it can probably still convey its historic architectural significance. But if that home were associated with a prominent member of that community, moving it may remove that historic association and it would no longer be eligible for that reason. And the reason we wanted to step through all of that is to make sure we know how to identify the primary character defining features and essential aspects of integrity so that we can apply the standards as part of the project review and determine whether the physical characteristics of that resource that convey its significance and justify its listing or eligibility for listing will be retained after the project. So again, I'll pause here and open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions for Amanda? I have one, Amanda. I hope it's a brief question. Um, it seems to me like there's a huge amount of discretion in these judgments and determinations, particularly on something like quote unquote feeling. Um, you know, and what what is, uh, you know, one person's view of this is really, really important, you know, someone else could, I would think, pretty easily disagree with that and relative to its importance. Could you speak to that topic briefly? I'd be happy to. Um, so uh, the National Park Service, um, and I think every preservation uh, professional too, will, will agree with you that that feeling is very subjective and um, open to interpretation. And the there's a bulletin, a National Park Service bulletin, and at the end of the slideshow, as well as in the packets that I believe were provided, uh, there's some links to additional guidance. Um, there's a resource called um, National, National Register Bulletin 15, and that goes into kind of evaluating a property and the different aspects of integrity and, and understanding each of those and how it's applied. Um, so there is um, more guidance available on that. But to go back to your first point, um, feeling alone would never be enough for something to be eligible. So for a property to be eligible, it has to have significance and it has to have integrity. And if the only aspect of integrity it has is, is feeling, that, that wouldn't necessarily qualify. So you would need to have more tangible things like location or setting or materials in order for it to to have integrity and to be eligible following the the national park service guidance okay thank you very much mm -hmm. there's no other questions from the commission okay then i'll move on to the next section which will be applying the standards this is our last section we will go through all 10 standards for rehabilitation, talking about the overall concepts and, and general idea behind the standards, as well as some examples and their applicability to illustrate some of those concepts. As I explained earlier, the the so the really excuse me, the rehabilitation standards are are 10 brief statements that are written to be intentionally broad so that they apply to a variety of property types and projects. 
the goal of the rehab standards overall, the overarching goal, is to extend the useful life of the property and ensure that it retains its historic character after a project is complete. The general guiding principles are to preserve historic features and materials to the extent feasible, repairing historic features rather than replacing them, and if they cannot be repaired, they should be replaced in kind using documentary evidence. So something like historic photos or a building permit or even physical evidence on the building of, of how those features originally appeared. Um, alterations are acceptable, but they should be compatible and distinguishable from the historic building itself. And they should also be reversible, which is a concept that I'll go into a little bit more detail later on in this section. Um, but the something I want to emphasize is that the standards are intended to manage change rather than prevent change. So with these standards, we're understanding that there needs to be some flexibility in order to um, extend the useful life of these buildings. So we'll start at the top, rehabilitation standard number one. This states that a property will be used as it was historically or be given a new use that requires minimal change to distinctive materials, features, spaces, and relationships. So this one is, is fairly simple. Um, the, just to comply with standard one, the new or continuing use will not require drastic changes to the resource. And we'll go back to the example of Casa Romantica, which we know was adaptively reused a couple different times. And modifications to the property were necessary to accommodate those new uses. But the primary character defining features of the property have been retained throughout those changes. And the property is still able to convey its historical significance. Another project is example is a project that GPA worked on in downtown Los Angeles. This is a historic photo of a bank lobby from the 1920s. This building was adaptively reused into a hotel, uh, which as you can see, didn't require too much change. So that was a, a compatible use and it complied with standard one. The, with applying standard one, the historic building should kind of lend itself to the new use, it's important to note that the programming should be adapted to fit the building and not the other way around. So if a project does not comply with standard number one, it probably will not comply with some of the other standards. Um, so it's important to make sure that um, the programming is flexible and willing to adapt to the historic features of the building. Rehabilitation standard number two, states that the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved and the removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. So this goes back to what we went over in section two. This is why it's important to understand and identify what those features are that characterize the property and learning or not learning but planning to avoid those and avoiding their unnecessary removal or alteration as part of the project. We've got a few examples here. Um, as you can see on the historic photo on the left, the original recessed porch on this public park building in Long Beach was infilled, and it definitely changes the overall visual character. It looks a little bit less inviting at the, where the entrance is a little unclear. So even a, a fairly minor change like that can really drastically change the historic character. Another similar example, these are two very similar houses in the same neighborhood. And the one on the right has undergone some pretty extensive alterations to the windows, the window openings, the porch, and the exterior cladding. And, and that has resulted in a loss of historic character. It doesn't appear as it did historically. And all of those changes probably could have been carried out in a more compatible way so that it might have appeared more like the house on the left. The next one, Rehabilitation Standard 3, indicates that each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Changes that create a false sense of historical development, such as adding conjectural features or architectural elements from other buildings, shall not be undertaken. So this is a common misconception that I feel like we frequently encounter 
where people feel that using salvaged features from other historic buildings from the same period is, is more compatible or preferable to installing new windows, for example. But in that situation, if you were to take windows from another historic building and put them onto the building you're working on, what is original and non-original can become unclear in the future. And so if there's no documentary evidence of what a feature looked like historically, such as a historic photo or something like that, it should be replaced with a compatible new feature rather than guessing, uh, which we'll also um, address a little bit in standard six and nine. Got some examples here uh, to uh, illustrate this concept. Um, so the building on the left is, is kind of an extreme example. Um, I think we call it the, uh, the Viking treatment, um, but it has been, it's undergone the application of ornamentation that wouldn't have originally been on this building, and it gives it kind of a false sense of history. Um, the example on the right is a little more subdued, um, but they borrowed from another style by installing a kind of classically inspired pediment onto a Spanish colonial revival building, and, and these types of things are, are not recommended for a historic property. So this is a, an interesting example. The changes here might be a little less obvious. Uh, we have a Spanish colonial revival style house that was modified over time, but kind of which part was, was modified? Uh, it's a little bit harder to tell. Uh, so as you can see, comparing these historic photos to the photo on the bottom, all of the features highlighted in orange were actually added to the house. Uh, it makes the house appear a bit more grand and, and maybe creates a false sense of history. And it almost starts to change the overall style. It, it's almost leaning more toward Mediterranean revival than Spanish colonial revival. And this concept will also play into standard nine, which we will address in a little bit, um, stating that additions should be clearly differentiated as new. So in this instance, these, all, these additions are, they're not really differentiated as new and it's difficult to tell um, just by observation, what parts are original without having this documentary evidence without the historic photos. Rehabilitation standard four. Um, this one is not encountered as frequently, but it may occur if there is a property that has more than one period of significance or more than one reason for being historic. And that is uh, changes to a property that have acquired significance in their own right will be retained and preserved. So this is a photo of the historic Pantages Theater, which opened in the 1920s during Prohibition. Um, so no one at the theater was was stopping by the bar for a drink um, that we know of. <laughs> but uh, the Frolic Room was established later in the 1930s after Prohib Prohibition ended, and this uh, little storefront here, although it's non-original, it has acquired significance in its own right and so would be retained as part of a compatible project involving this theater. Rehabilitation standard number five states that distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a property shall be preserved. And this one is very similar to standard two, but there's a little bit more of a focus on materials and workmanship. So some of the, the finer details, um, for example, you know, the appearance of wood stain versus wood paint um, that can really change the feeling of a, of a property. Um, and if you have evidence of construction techniques like hand troweled stucco or board formed concrete or you know, different types of mortar joints, those details are, can be very important to a uh, building conveying its historic significance. So going back to section two, this is why um, that first step of identifying the character defining features is so important. So just a few examples to illustrate this concept. Uh, one example of a treatment that does not usually comply with the standards is removing the plaster finish from walls to reveal historic masonry. Um, not only does this leave the brick susceptible to damage, but it, it changes the character of that space. It makes it seem maybe a little bit more industrial than a fully finished space. And similarly, the photo on the right is leaving unfinished ceilings with exposed wiring and, and venting and things like that in a space that historically had finished ceilings. 
And this is an example of two very similar houses on the same street showing that even, you know, the windows have changed, but even the subtle change in the texture, texture of the stucco cladding has altered the overall appearance of that historic resource. Rehabilitation standard six, this one is, is pretty long, but we can break it down into a couple of different parts. Um, it's basically running through that hierarchy of treatments that we started to discuss before, where the priority is to retain historic features, even if they're deteriorated, and to repair them as needed. And if they are beyond repair, then they should be replaced in kind to the extent feasible. Um, if there is a feature that is missing, then you'll want to use that documentary evidence, such as historic photos. Um, if you don't have that documentary evidence, then you'll probably have to replace it with something that is new and compatible, which will be addressed in Standard 9. Just some examples illustrating Standard 6. Um, here's some photos of the wood floors of the Ole Hansen Beach Club. They were kind of needing some repairs, but they were retained and refinished and now they're looking much better and um, their useful life will be extended because of that treatment and that protective coating. This is another example of a project that GPA worked on in the city of Pasadena. Uh, the before photo on the left, you can see that this building was highly deteriorated. Some of the windows, the glazing is missing and the sashes are falling apart. So. The contractors repaired the ones that were salvageable and those that were beyond repair were replaced in kind using other existing windows on the building as an example to guide the, the creation of the new replacement windows. Rehabilitation Standard 7 addresses uh, chemical or physical treatments that might cause damage to historic materials and avoiding that. And the surface cleaning, if appropriate, shall be undertaken using the gentlest means possible. So treatments that are known to cause damage to historic materials like sandblasting should be avoided completely uh, when applying the standards. And if a chemical or physical treatment is necessary, it's important to identify the gentlest effective means possible. Uh, ways of doing that might include reviewing the National Park Service guidelines, the preservation briefs, or tech notes to find information about the specific material in question, whether it's masonry or metal or wood. There's um, lots of, of guidance available on that website. Um, you may also think about retaining a qualified practi practitioner who has experience in, in treating that historic fabric and, and doing those cleanings with appropriate products. Um, or another option is to do small test patches in inconspicuous areas, um, similar to kind of cleaning products around the house. You'd want to test it someplace that's not highly visible and make sure that it doesn't cause any damage before applying that treatment to a larger surface area. Something that we encounter fairly often is that original wood trim has been painted over in a historic home or even on the exterior. Um, so in this instance, if you wanted to remove the paint, it would be important to identify that the gentlest means possible to remove that paint without damaging the wood below. Um, I think it, it's often a common misconception that, that gentle cleaning methods are not as effective. Uh, but as you can see from these photos of another project that we worked on that was in quite a deteriorated state at the onset, um, even even gentle cleaning methods that don't damage the underlying materials are, are effective even in those extreme scenarios. Standard 8 applies to archaeological resources. Um, it's unlikely that the board would be determining impacts to archaeological resources as part of the project review, but it may apply for projects that involve ground disturbance or projects that are in the vicinity of known archaeological resources. Um, and if that happens, there's protocols to follow of, you know, contacting the city and contacting a qualified archaeologist to plan, you know, make mitigation plan to either document it and leave it as it is. Um, and other other measures, um, archaeological 
this is very difficult to say, archaeology is um, outside of our area of expertise, but um, that's that's what Standard 8 is, is addressing. Um, this image here on this slide is some circa 1900 granite road and curb that was uncovered during construction of a bridge project. Um, so we had an archaeologist come out and do construction monitoring to ensure that it was retained in place and, and wasn't damaged as a result of the, the project. So this can sometimes be um, something that applies in the event of an unexpected discovery. Okay, so standards nine and 10 are probably the ones that you will encounter most often that will be most applicable to your project review. Um, they are also a little bit lengthy, but uh, standard nine at the top states that new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction shall not destroy historic materials that characterize the property. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. And standard 10 at the bottom states that the new additions and adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in such a manner but if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. So the standard nine, so um, they shall not destroy historic materials that characterize the property. This goes back again to that previous exercise of identifying what those features are and which are the most important. Ideally, they will all be retained, but if there are you know, an addition or changes that are necessary as part of a project, this work can be planned around features that may be less vital to conveying the significance, such as a rear elevation or, you know, adding a door to a window opening that was already altered previously. The second part of Standard 9, um, the, work, the new work shall be differentiated from the old and be compatible. So there is some room for creativity here. Uh, on the, the design side, um, this should indicate where the old building ends and the new construction begins. Um, different features that could be incorporated to differentiate those two volumes might be using things like recessed wall planes or lower roof heights, um, slightly different type of cladding or variations in window design or operation. Um, so there's kind of an infinite number of, of ways that that can be achieved. And we'll have some examples on the following slides. And the, the last component of standard nine, um, compatible with the massing size, scale, and architectural features, um, kind of you don't want it to be so differentiated that it becomes incompatible. Um, but generally, you know, an appropriately sized addition that echoes the features of the historical resource um, will we'll generally comply with the standards in, in most situations. Um, I think the important thing to keep in mind for Standard 9 is that you don't want to upstage the historical resource. And similarly, with Standard 10 at the bottom, um, the, if you were to remove the addition, you know, the, the essential form and integrity of the historic property is, is still intact. So this is something where you want it to be additive rather than subtractive. So if you have an addition, you know, having it be, you know, completely on the rear or, you know, constructed in such a way that the original massing of the historic building is still evident. Um, but let's, um, let's look at some photos here that might be able to explain these a little bit better than, <laughs> than I can in words. Um, so in this slide, the original one-story residence at the bottom, it's not very intact, but this second-story addition is, is so large, it kind of illustrates uh, what not to do, basically. Um, it's incompatible with the size, the shape, the massing. It's much larger than the original residence. It's highly visible from the street, and it introduces a new roof profile, new cladding material even a new window shape, so it's it's almost as, as opposite as, as it could be, which it would not be recommended when applying the standards. Another kind of extreme example is this very contemporary looking rooftop addition on a single story Craftsman house. Um, while the, the size of it is more appropriate than the other one, and it's it's located toward the rear, which is, is generally more preferable, um, the 
the overall design of it is is very different from the Craftsman style residence. So it's um it's so differentiated that it's kind of tipped over that line into being incompatible. So this is an example of a second story addition that was maybe a little bit more successful. As you can see, it's not very visible from the front elevation. The massing of it are, is oriented towards the rear of the house and the roof profile echoes the roof profile of the original building. Um, so it, it, it's a little bit more successful of an addition and it doesn't compete with the original house. You can still see the original form of the house and, and it's not um, upstaged by that new addition. Oftentimes, uh, property, there are properties that can be very small, um, very you know, small lots with little to no room to create more living space, just with a, a rear addition. Uh, so sometimes there needs to be a little bit more creativity and flexibility in, in finding a solution. Um, the addition, it doesn't have to be invisible, but ways to kind of minimize its appearance, as has been done here, is orienting toward the rear of the house and taking care to differentiate the old from new. In this example, the roof form echoes the form of the original house, but the orientation has been flipped, so it's a side gable rather than a front gable, and it has compatible detailing, but it's it's not the same detailing as seen on the original volume. So that is a, a way of of differentiating that and you know completing a compatible addition even when there are constraints on the site and what you can do. This is a project that was unfortunately never constructed, but I think it's a great example to illustrate kind of the spirit of standards nine and 10. It's uh, less subtle than some of the other examples that I, that I showed, but it demonstrates how you can be a little creative in coming up with a solution that meets the project goals and is compatible yet differentiated. And you can kind of see, if you imagine that that upper story addition were removed, the, the essential form and integrity of that historic building in the top photo would remain almost entirely. Um, so I, I always like to show this one as an example of, of standards 9 and 10. Here's another example. This is from the illustrated standards, actually, the National Park Service. The addition to the right is compatible in massing size and scale. It's smaller than the original building. The roof height is lowered. It's deferential to the original construction. And it's incorporated incorporated simplified details from the historic construction, but not mimicking them. So it's, it's echoing the historic building, but not copying it. And the use of a hyphen, um, which is uh, kind of a, a smaller connection to the original building minimizes the amount of historic fabric that would need to be removed in order to construct it. So if the addition were removed and the brick on the rear elevation were replaced, the essential form and integrity of that historic building would still be intact. So I think that's another great example of a successful rehabilitation project. I also wanted to address some specific scenarios that I understand your commission may be encountering fairly often. Um, and that includes um, changes to the site or landscaping for rehabilitation projects. Um, like everything else, the most appropriate treatment will depend on the site, its level of significance, and or rather the level of significance of the landscaping itself and the existing level of integrity. As with uh, most other project components, removing primary character defining landscape features is not recommended. Um, these may be things like planting areas or fountains or walls or paths or things like that. Um, but for most properties, the most important thing is to maintain the historic relationship between a building and its site. So a site design that is compatible with the overall historic character of the property it retains the primary character defining features of that site and landscaping that would likely comply with the standards um, for a district contributor if they wanted to say replace their lawn with drought tolerant landscaping that would likely be you know a compatible 
alteration because it's maintaining the historic planting area. It's just that the planting material is a little bit different. For landscaping that derives its significance from the original design and appearance of specific plantings, so say you have a formally designed garden with, with hedges and a, a flower garden, or you have a type of fruit orchard, it is usually acceptable to replace those plantings in kind if they're deteriorated um, due to disease or just, you know, they've reached the end of their lifespan. Um, the National Park Service does recognize that that plant material isn't permanent. Um, so that is, is acceptable if that's necessary. Um, and if for some reason it's not feasible to replace those plantings exactly, using a, a visually similar planting may be appropriate. So a similar type of tree or shrub or flower that has a similar visual effect, um, that can be that can be appropriate when following the standards. And one last point I wanted to talk about was reversibility. Um, the idea of reversible treatments, it's, it's basically treatments that achieve the project goals without making permanent or drastic changes to character defining features. Um, one example in the rehabilitation guidelines is installing locks or window guards or removable storm windows to enhance the safety, security, or energy conservation of windows rather than replacing them outright. You know, if you add some weather stripping or some interior shutters, um, that would always be recommended before installing you know, different dual pane glass or new windows altogether. And another uh, example illustrating this concept of reversibility is this rear alteration. Again, it's connected to the original building with a hyphen. And as you can see, it's narrow enough that it doesn't intersect with the windows of that rear elevation of that house or the window shutters. So the area that's currently occupied by the hyphen, it could be more easily filled in with some cladding that matches the original rather than kind of replacing that whole elevation and then recreating the windows that were historically there. Um, so that is kind of another example of, of what is meant by reversibility. And okay, so that concludes our, our final section. We'll open it up to questions again um, at the end, but just to review everything we went over, um, every project will be different uh, due to the character of the resource and the unique considerations and constraints and opportunities of, of that resource and its setting. The overall spirit of the standards is to achieve a balance between continuity and change to guide the compatible change but not prevent it. So they are intended to be flexible while preserving the historic character of the building. So. The first order of business is to preserve character defining features as much as you can, repair them rather than replace them. And if they can't be repaired, replace them in kind using documentary evidence, no guessing or conjectural features. Um, when alterations are needed to meet the project goals, we should prioritize putting those on, on rear or secondary elevations or parts of the building that are less visible when it's feasible. And the alterations should be compatible with the historic character of the property, but distinguishable as non-original, um, as we saw in some of those images. And the alterations should be reversible to the extent feasible. So nothing drastic, uh, things that can be taken back in the future if needed. So I can open it up to questions now. Uh, the next slide is just some sources of additional guidance. Um, including the standards and guidelines. There's also a set of rehabilitation guidelines specifically addressing sustainability. So things like solar panels or roof gardens or shade trees, things like that. The concepts of significance and integrity are addressed in the National Register Bulletin 15 or how to apply the National Criteria, National Register Criteria for evaluation. And then there are tons of additional guidance and bulletins and memos on specific topics or materials or features on the National Park Service website. Um, there's a whole series of preservation briefs, interpreting the standards bulletins, which are kind of case studies about different projects and how they were or were not successful, 
and then tech notes, which are just kind of best practices guidance for um, different preservation matters, <laughs> uh, physical material restoration and things like that. Does that conclude your presentation, Amanda? Yes, yes, apologies, I was looking for the mute. Uh, yes, I'll, I can open it up to questions here now. Okay, thank you very much. Does anyone on the commission have any questions? Bart? Uh, I just want to um, say Amanda did a wonderful job. That's the most concise um, report on this that I've been through. So Great. I'm glad to hear that. I'm oh, glad it was helpful. And, uh, I would suggest you open it to public questions. We've got some staff here and some significant historic preservation people from the city. So, and I don't know how long we can push back the regular meeting, but uh, uh, I would certainly be welcome to listen to the questions. I would say <clears throat> we typically would want to start it within 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, at 15 sounds a little bit long. We're at 6.04. I'd say maybe five or ten yeah. I, I have an or so idea. minutes. By a uh, show of hands, how many people are interested in making comment on this? Presentation. Two. Okay. I think we'd be good then to continue. Does that uh, seem reasonable? That, that seems absolutely reasonable. Um, would you like to limit the public comments or questions so I we think can set up a timer? Standard three minute. Yeah, the standard comment okay. period. Staff will take care of that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, do we need to ask them to fill out comment cards? I think if for this um, not being a public hearing, if they can just, uh, if they would like name. to state their name. Okay. For the record. Thank you. We would love to hear from anyone who wishes to make comment. Um, can I just state from here? It's just a quick question. Well, I think if you're willing and able, we'd love to get you at the microphone because otherwise your question won't be heard. You could repeat it for me. I could repeat it for you if you like. Um, Jonathan, can you hand out someone? The identification of the character defining features. How important? DPR forms and identifying the features. Okay, I'll repeat the question. Um, regarding the identification of the character defining features, how important is the DPR forms to those features? Is that adequate? Is that your question, sir? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I can go ahead and answer. Um, the DPR form will sometimes call out the character defining features if the evaluator has gone to that level of detail. Um, if they haven't, then there should be some clues on the DPR form as to the, the type and reason for its historical significance, uh, including the period of significance and a description of any alterations over time. So if the DPR form doesn't include an identification of character defining features, the information on that form should help inform that identification process. Thank you. Does that, do you have any follow on questions related to that, sir? Yeah, uh, the, the DPR forms that we have miss a lot of the character defining features, and they've also got some features on there that are not really features. I mean, they're, uh, like they mentioned, a shed roof that uh, was added after the fact, and they don't point out the fact that it was added after the fact. So how, how do we handle these errors in the uh, DPR character defining feature? The, the question was, Amanda, the DPR form doesn't seem to adequately question about all the character defining features or sometimes um, you know, leaves them open. For example, with shed roofs, um, where it doesn't ask for why it is or isn't important. Is that effectively a question? Can you hear us, Amanda? Oh, I'm sorry. I, was, I thought you were waiting for the uh, commenter to respond. My apologies. Um, so the, the DPR forms can vary depending on why they were prepared. Oftentimes, they are prepared as part of a historic resources survey. So the level of detail is not always 
um, extremely high. Sometimes it's a little bit more service level because the consultant or whomever is, is preparing lots of forms all at once. Um, so they don't always clearly state the character defining features. Sometimes it's, it's kind of brief information that will inform the, the historic survey. Um, so it, it really just depends on the level of detail and the, the reason that those DPR forms were prepared. So you wouldn't always be able to rely just on that form to identify the character defining features. But um, as I said earlier, they can be an important resource in, in going through that exercise of understanding why it's important, when it's important, and um, and those physical features that help convey that, that history. So sometimes there is a, an additional step needed, even if there's already a, a DPR form prepared. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Sir, I saw your hand. If you're willing and able, I'd love to get you to speak to step to the mic so it can get on the record, but if you want me to repeat your question, I will. This Okay, hang on just a sec. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Amanda, the questions were, why does the city require, con two-part two question, why does the city require historical consultants um, be commissioned on certain projects? Uh, I mean, I can I can answer that question broadly. It, it may be more of a question for the planning department, um, but typically, as historic consultants were retained by cities such as San Clemente or West Hollywood or any number of uh, local agencies that we um, assist in their historic preservation duties. Um, oftentimes, we are retained as an extension of city staff to assist them with carrying out their obligations under CEQA and assessing for potential impacts to historical resources as part of those obligations. Um, that's kind of a, a broad answer. There, there may be more specifics uh, for the city of San Clemente, but um, in general, that's, that's why we were retained. Thank you. So a follow-on question for staff would be, you guys make the determination, like depending on the proposed project, and its level of impact, whether you can assess it in-house or an outside consultant is retained, is that accurate? Uh, so that is accurate, yes. So there's a number of projects that will come in front of us where uh, application of the standards or, or the type of uh, request is pretty standard and uh, we're comfortable fielding that in-house. There's other types of requests that come through that, uh, as we've seen tonight, that there there is some um, uh, gray area within the standards or what's the best way to apply the standards or lack of familiarity with a, the, the specific type of request um, that's come through. So in those cases, uh, we, we do seek uh, and this relates to the next question that's upcoming, but someone who is a uh, qualified historic preservationist, we don't have a qualified historic preservationist on staff. We have staff that meets um, the CLG standards with five or more years of experience working on projects like this, a couple of us that would meet that qualification, but we're still not a uh, quote unquote qualified historic preservation professional. Uh, and that's when we do look for uh, a third party consultant to augment our abilities at the planning division. Thank you. So, so certification. Or something? Oh, that's my. That's his part two question. So, Amanda, the part two question was, um, what are the necessary qualifications and training to become a historic preservation professional, and is there some kind of a designation that must be achieved? So there are the Secretary of the Interior standards professional qualification standards. Or excuse me, Secretary of the Interior's professional qualification standards. Uh, those are a series of standards that are codified and indicate the level of experience and training necessary in order to meet those standards. 
for architectural history, I believe, uh, speaking uh, from memory, that it is a college degree, either four-year or a master's degree in historic preservation or um, closely related field, as well as a few years of professional experience, um, you know, working full-time as a preservation professional. Thank you. I see one other hand. You're limited to three minutes, sir. So if we Thank you very much. Track. My name is Michael Luna. I'm a local architect in San Clemente. And I just have a, a quick question with regard to, and so I could better understand, and hopefully we could all better understand. With all of these standards uh, in, uh, which dictate uh, uh, compliance and goals uh, for historic preservation, uh, what happens when you have a project that doesn't meet all of the standards. It's my understanding that the standards are intended to be flexible uh, with the overall goal of uh, uh, saving our historic structures. Uh, but what about when you just can't meet all of the standards, but yet your project is uh, definitely so compatible with most of all of the standards, but how do you can't typically check off all of the boxes, I don't think. Uh, can you explain, please, the flexibility that's built into the standards for overall conformance, and how do you judge an overall approval uh, of an application uh, based upon uh, some things complying and some others don't? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So to answer the first part of your question there, there is some flexibility. There is a bit of a release valve there. Um, it's not always necessary in certain circumstances to comply with each of the 10 standards in order for the project to be compatible and comply overall. Um, there are things like economic visibility or you know, different constraints on the site, um, code compliance or, or other regulations that you may be trying to thread the needle um, and sometimes you know, as you said, it's it's not always possible to meet all of the, the standards for every project. Um, and in those instances, I think the the overall, the bottom line is, is whether this resource will retain those physical characteristics that justify, you know, convey its historic significance and justify its conclusion or inclusion on a local register or state register. So kind of going back to that, that first section of the presentation that, you know, the bottom line is, is identifying those character defining features that are crucial to conveying that significance and whether they will retain those after the project is over. And there are certain things that will supersede the historic, you know, if it's something is, is very unsafe or completely infeasible, you know, there are certain things where considerations where the the compliance may have to take a back seat. Um, but I do understand that there are certain projects that have a, a lot of um, different different constraints. So it can be it can be tricky sometimes. Thank you very much. Are there any other hands from members of the public? Chair, we're getting a little bit uh, over on our regular meeting. Um, if anyone does have any public comments, they can of course make it during the regular meeting. Okay, yeah, so thank you. As a reminder, we're, we're gonna close this meeting, but we're gonna open our Planning Commission meeting, but there's a public comment at the beginning of the period, at the beginning of that meeting, so if you think of something, you could um, make a comment then. So with that, I will close this study session, um, and then in a couple minutes, we will kick off the regularly scheduled Planning Commission meeting. Thank you. So, Chair, if I can, I, I recommend that uh, the uh, Planning Commission adjourn the study session, <clears throat> open the regular meeting, and if you'd like a break, call for a five-minute break at that point. I'm sorry, we missed the adjournment. So, yes, I adjourn this study session um, to the next scheduled one on Wednesday, July 19th, 2023, at 5 p.m. in this City Hall location. And... With that, I will open the Planning Commission meeting.
uh, of today, June 21st. Uh, sorry for the delay in opening. Um, and um, Commissioner Prescott Laughlin, can you please read us, um, uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Can we please have roll call? Commissioner Crandall? Here. Commissioner Davis? Here. Commissioner McCacken? Here. Commissioner Prescott Leffler? Here. Chair Pro Tem Camp? Here. Vice Chair Cosgrove? Here. And Chair McCann? Here. Thank you. Um, I don't see it on the agenda, but I think last time you had identified that. And yes, um, the uh, selection of new chair, I apologize. The new appointments, even though they're uh, continuing on, they don't technically take effect until the uh, new fiscal year after July 1st. So it'll be at the next meeting. Okay, moving on. Uh, I see no special orders of business. 5A minutes of the regular meeting of the Planning Commission of June 7th, 2023. Under new business number nine, it has me as being reappointed. I think it was probably, is it you? Because I, I wasn't reappointed. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm next year. Bart, I think you should take a look at it. it was your comments. It, it kind of got them out of order. Or just delete that. Yeah. Just delete my name. I wasn't reappointed. Yeah, either was I. Uh, which page are you on? We're on page 10 of the minutes, item 9, new business. Commissioner Crandall announced that he, Commissioner McCacken, and Vice Chair Cosgrove have been reappointed to the commission. I, that's I think not his comment was about applying for the council, council vacancy. Yeah, if that yeah. Was yeah. And then the reappointment went to Commissioner Camp and Crandall and. Uh, Mr. Davis, yeah. Right. Those need to be amended. Okay, so uh, the first sentence is about um, a comment that Commissioner Crandall made about running, uh, throwing their hat in the ring for the mm -hmm. council appointment. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, so was there a comment about uh, the reappointment of the commissioners. Was that yes. part of that comment as well? Secondary, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Three separate sentence. Um, since, yeah. since these comments are uh, not substantive as far as a, a project's concerned, if you want to give staff direction to review the tape and correct the, the record, um, this seems a little bit um, difficult to wordsmith uh, from here. But if you just give staff direction, we'll, we'll clean that up. I'd so move to have staff listen to the tapes and re the nine new business section. Okay, I have a motion with the revision. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? They pass. Thank you. Good catch. Um, oral and written communications. <clears throat> is there anybody here in the audience that wishes to speak on any item that is not on the agenda tonight? I'm seeing none. Moving on. No items on the consent calendar. Item 8A, public hearing. <clears throat> Conditional use permit 22-370 and minor cultural heritage permit 23-116. Drift Distillery and Kitchen Full Alcohol and Entertainment, 115 South El Camino Real. Do we have a staff report? Yes, we do. Chair, can we open the um, public hearing first? Thank you. I now open the public hearing. And then um, disclose any conflicts or ex parte communications. Uh, does anybody have any conflicts or ex parte communications on I this did, item? I did receive uh, an email from... Uh, an ex-commissioner and city council member, Wayne Eagleston, um, 
with the comment um, regarding the conditional use permit part of the um, amplified music that it was his preference um, that it would be a year unamplified and then if no problems were occurred to try a um, amplified music um, change to the conditional use permit and that was his comment. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I got the same, uh, e I th well, similar email, same person. Um, I also did a uh, site walk, made observations. I forwarded those observations to staff mm -hmm. because there's, I'm taking some issues with their characterization of boundaries and adjacencies in the staff report. So I documented those, sent those to the staff. Um, I also contacted the Villar Hotel and I asked them if they receive complaints about noise from their guests from the businesses on El Camino Real that are adjacent to the project site and received uh, some feedback from the hotel that they in fact do get those on a regular basis. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, as I always try to do, I try to go out and drive the property and I did visit the property two days ago just to familiar, familiarize myself as far as mixed use. I think we all um, struggle when we're trying to combine business with area residential. So I just wanted to make sure that I understood the location. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Now a staff report. <laughs> Good evening, Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Chris Johnson, Senior Planner, City of San Clemente. Uh, this evening, staff will be providing a brief presentation of the proposed drift distillery uh, and kitchen project. The project is located at 115 South El Camino Real and is within the central business and architectural overlays. The site, uh, as shown here, outlined in yellow, on the image on the right is located between El Camino Real and Avenida de la Estrella. Slide. The proposed project includes a request to perform tenant improvements with an existing commercial space to establish a sit-down restaurant with an ancillary distillery tasting room with a light manufacturing of spirits and amplified live entertainment. The proposed restaurant would be within 3,750 square feet of the existing building. 300 square feet of that space includes a tasting room and a 300 square foot patio area. The project is proposing minor exterior modifications to the building with no expansion of the existing footprint. Required entitlements for the project include uh, a conditional use permit, uh, which is required for indoor outdoor sale of full alcohol service and amplified live entertainment due to the project's location within the architectural overlay a minor cultural heritage permit is also required the project resides within two lots totaling 11,994 square feet here's a photograph of the existing condition looking north from el camino real the project site includes three tenant spaces, most recently occupied by La Rocco's Pizza, an escrow office, and a barber, barber shop uh, salon tenant, which is, which is currently the only active business. The lot is separated by a lower and upper level. Uh, access between the two lots is currently provided by a stairway. The access ramp connecting the two lots uh, toward the back of the, the image there on the right uh, is not utilized presently for through traffic. Here's an existing photograph of the upper parking area along Avenida de la Estrella. There are a total of eight marked par parking spaces located on the upper level. Here 
Here's an image of the site plan. Uh, there are a total of 17 parking spaces proposed. That includes one ADA stall. Uh, parking requirements for the use in this zone is 16 spaces. There are a total of eight parking spaces located on the upper level as noted, and nine spaces in the lot fronting El Camino Real. A shared parking agreement is in place to ensure that parking stalls on the two lots remain available for the project while the business is in operation. Both lots are under the same ownership. Staff has included a condition of approval uh, 4.11 uh, with regards to the shared parking agreement uh, and, it, and its requirement that it be in place for this, for this business. The applicant is also proposing a paved pedestrian walkway to connect El Camino Real and Avenida de la Estrella, which you can see, let's see if my mouse isn't working, here it is. Um, on the side here toward the right of the image, you can see the paved parking that will connect uh, El Camino Real with the upper lot. Uh, paving here uh, will be matching, is, is, is anticipated to match uh, the paving, the heron bone paving that's along uh, El Camino Real presently. Uh, here's an image of the floor plan with the major uh, interior spaces and outdoor uh, patio area. The applicant is proposing 78 indoor seats and 16 outdoor seats on the patio area. The hours of operation are from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. during weekdays and from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. Hours of operation are similar to other uses in the area as noted in the staff report. The applicant is, as noted, also proposing indoor amplified live entertainment with the number of events anticipated to be between three to five days per month. Uh, and you can see the location of the proposed uh, entertainment area. The stage is here in this location. Here's the colored elevation of the project from the lower parking lot on El Camino Real. The applicant is proposing several exterior improvements to the building. These include repainting the building's stucco and adding an accented trim, new windows and doors, modifications to create an open air patio area with detailed wrought iron railings and incorporating a heavy, a heavy wooden door at the main entrance as shown here. Here's the code elevation of the project's frontage from El Camino Real. The applicant is also proposing to screen the existing trash enclosure, which is here. It's not presently uh, enclosed. Uh, the trash enclosure and rooftop equipment are also being proposed to be screened, as you can see in this location here, uh, with a matching dark wood stain. A dark stained wood pergola is also proposed along the building's frontage that will also wrap the side of the building uh, terminating at the patio area. Uh, new windows and doors are also proposed. Landscaping is proposed in pots and in planters affixed to the building. In-ground landscaping is also proposed at locations along Avenida de, Estrella, de la Estrella. Per condition of approval 419, staff is, is requesting that the landscaping be in ground. Proposed materials are shown on this slide. Uh, Planning Division staff has included a condition of approval 4.17 that requires all exterior architectural elevations and materials to be reviewed and approved by Planning Division staff prior to their installation and prior to the issuance of building permits. Uh, with regards to uh, architectural materials uh, and landscaping, it should be noted that uh, design review for this project was not required for minor modifications, which staff is uh, noting this project is, uh, in this example, exterior alterations. However, due to the project's location within the central business and architectural overlay districts, Planning Division staff requested design review of the project to ensure architectural quality, style, and consistency with city adopted guidelines. Consistency with uh, design review recommendations is included as attachment four to the staff report. The planning division has confirmed that the project is consistent uh, with the general plan and zone in which it is located. Uh, the project improves the quality and architectural integrity of the existing building 
and achieves improved consistency with the city's design guidelines. With the incorporation of conditions of approval, staff does not anticipate the project would be detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare, or material or in, materially injurious to adjacent properties. The planning division recommends that the project be found categorically exempt from CEQA and that the resolution PC 23011 be approved for conditional use permit 22370 and minor cultural heritage permit 23116 for the drift distillery and kitchen project subject to conditions of approval. That ends uh, staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Does the commission have any questions for staff? Um, were th these documents in our package uh, with the new renderings? Because I didn't. I didn't see it either. I mean, this first I've seen. Those Everybody, elevations. Everybody's four feet blank. Minus. That page four is blank. Building material elevations, all that stuff. Yeah, we didn't get that stuff in our packet. Okay, it'd be, good, it'd be good to have that that kind of material in our packet next time. <laughs> yeah, the project plans are attached. Uh, it should be attachment five in your materials. Okay. This is where. Yeah, we're not seeing it. Chris, do you, how many pages should attachment five be? Actual color. Attachment page. five has about four or five sheets. Okay. Floor plan, site plan, which we've already reviewed uh, for the slideshow, uh, and then the um, presentation, rather, and then there's two elevations that show the architectural elevations and one sheet showing the materials. Okay. Why don't... Um um, the plans as they were printed out for the binders do not appear to be um, all of the sheets necessary to review. So I would recommend let's take a, a recess at this point in time. We can... Uh, uh, I, I think we can probably make a determination. I just wanted to point out that I was disappointed in the package and now I realize <laughs> that there were important information missing yeah I, mean, I, I like I, what I saw on the screen yeah I, I don't know if, they, if, the, if the original sheet that um, our staff was using to make copies was double-sided and it just turned out to be a, a one-sided copy but if you'd like I can and I think it's probably best for the record if we print out a couple copies put them in the back of the room give uh, any members of the public that are here time to review that and then give uh, the Commission a, a full set of plans. Yeah, I'll take a copy. That'd be great for me. Okay. So we can follow along while. Yeah. Okay. Um, Is that? I mean. I can. I can go take care of that, or we can take a break, and. Okay. Why don't we take? Uh, what should we, ten minutes? Ten minute would be excellent. Oh, exactly. I think there's something back there, maybe. Oh, okay. Well, maybe, uh, All right. So, so one other comment, we'll by the way, maybe pig, the applicants report while they're doing that. Pig, piggyback. Yeah. Okay. Pig okay. Presentation while we're waiting. Okay. Um, piggybacking on that comment, though, like Chris said, hey, attachment five. None of the attachments are labeled in the packet as attachment one, attachment two, attachment three. Um, they're listed uh, in the back of the staff report, but they're not labeled as far as what's what. Just for the just for next time um, so I think like they I think they, they they are the plans themselves are, uh, don't appear to um, but they often do not have an attachment listed on them because they're they're just they're the plans and that's generally understood but the rest of them have an attachment that's I see listed two, at the top. two and three are okay um, well, do we mind if we jump around and maybe take public comment now, uh, particularly from the applicant 
um, while we're waiting for those copies to be made? Absolutely. Is that, is that acceptable? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, before we do that, were there any other questions from the commission to staff? Yes. Go ahead. I mean, is the time we're doing that right now? Well, we're, we're asking questions right now, then we'll receive yeah. public comment, then we'll yeah, discuss yeah. later. But if you could turn on your mic. So I read in here, it, it talks about, you know, three to five amplified events a month uh, that they're, they're anticipating. What, what's exactly an event? Did you kind of go over it? what an event means? Is this a wedding? No, this is, this is entertain, live entertainment, uh, so this would be music. So just a band or, or something that's amplified, and only three to five times a month. Yes, that's what the applicant has uh, shared. Yeah, okay. I'm sure I have more, but I know it's that time. I'll just piggyback on that. Thank you. However, there's not a condition of approval to that uh, number, correct? Uh, for clarification, the, the, the narrative that's provided by the applicant is noted that there would be that it's anticipated that three to five events would occur per month. Uh, it's not limited necessarily to three to five. Um, I wouldn't think that was the intent of the applicant, but uh, that's what's been stated. So I don't know that we would uh, disallow any more than five per month or that that's, that's being requested as part of this uh, application. Unless it's a condition of approval, I don't know how we do that. W this project has been conditioned similarly to other uh, uh, businesses um, that provide amplified sound or live entertainment to uh, uh, delineate when the event can occur, not how many times per month it can occur. So the project is conditioned, and I'll say, I'll use an example of, um, I think, uh, H.H. Cotton's or uh, Beach Fire, they're, they're, um, they have hours of the op of uh, allowable operations for live entertainment and amplified sound throughout the week. They don't have a, there's no limitation on how many days a month they can have live entertainment or amplified sound. Let me, let me jump in and say what I think this says, because <laughs> I think there's confusion. I think this is an application for a conditional use permit to operate uh, their distillery and kitchen with amplified live entertainment during their operating hours. That's seven days a week. That is from opening to closing. What the special events mean, I have no idea. That's confusing. And whether that means, and so I think we do need clarification on that because uh, I didn't see anything in there in the conditions about that. But my read of this is that it would be amplified live entertainment while they're are, are open. I think you're correct. Look at 7.25 of the conditions of approval mm -hmm. on page 8. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 11 a.m. to, yeah, exactly. Those are the same hours as operation. It's conditional where they can have it every night of the week. And um, I'm sorry to step in on you. Yeah, but, no, go ahead. Um, does this also include, I know it's been a hot topic and never really clarified, um, live TV, or not live TV, TV uh, is amplified sound inside. So Monday night football, whatever, um, that's mm. been discussed in the past. I don't know if it was really ever resolved. Um, but what's been enforced lately? Because sometimes I'll even throw, and I, I'm a fan of this particular business. It's a good business. Um, but um, is that considered amplified sound so that can't be on the patio? Uh, yeah, so um, exterior amplified sound um, does require a permit. Interior ambient sound that may be through an amplified device like a, a small radio or a TV, um, that's been generally accepted as mm -hmm. background noise, so to speak. It's not a, it in, it, in and of itself is not the main draw. Okay, I have a question. Can, can we bring up the, um, 
their interior floor plan. Can you bring that up on the screen? So I read in here while you're getting that is that their intention is not to have the speakers facing towards windows or doors. And that quick view, and I was, I've been trying to wonder where that stage was. You know, if, if that's the case, where's the stage? So that's my, con my thought was, I was hoping it was going to be in the front, projected maybe backwards or in the, the bottom right corner, like stuffing the sound towards the wall first. But the, where that stage is, if that's the case, I'm just kind of brainstorming here. I didn't even know where it was. But that's exactly, I don't know how they would, right? That's the stage, right? This is El Camino, right? At the bottom. Yes. yes. Yeah, the yes. Low, lower portion of the slide is El Camino, yeah. El Camino is at the bottom, yes. The only way sound can go out is at the doors, right? Through every door and every window, as I see it. Closed. Well, the, the... And, like, if you look at page 7, it says, you know, we have the ability to go back in and shut things down. And also it has to go by the sound ordinance. That's right. require of everybody else. And there can't be any sound, amplified sound out on the patio. Right. So, so they need to keep their doors closed. Yeah, and that, that's my concern is it does say in here that if it becomes a problem, the, the, we could, or the city can pull back that, right. that right, it's CUP, fair. right? And we don't want that to happen. So we want to try to hammer everything out right now as we're doing it. So if somehow we're saying we're not facing speakers towards doors and windows or they're supposed to be closed, then that stage, maybe, maybe there's a different way. I don't know. Just thinking aloud, you know. I didn't see a floor plan before. Right now, I just think it's control that you know the doors and windows are what's open because they can't do yeah. it outside, and they're low. So if there is sound coming out like the front, it's going to go across to the commercial district. Yeah, it, it could go if it went beyond the commercial buildings. It could go to the residential area, but then you've got height at the back, so it's going to reflect off that to get to the Volari Hotel. There's nothing directly. Mm. Pointing to the Volari. Mm -hmm. It's pointing to the other commercial. Mm -hmm. It's pointing out to commercial across El Camino. Plus, there's an incline, you know, uh, the hill. So that sound would most likely be projected somewhere up rather than to the hotel. But if they keep the doors closed, I think it becomes a moot issue. And, anyways, if it does become an issue, we have the rights to claw back. And we don't want that. No, but they know that we have it, so they'll keep the doors closed. Yeah, self closing doors might be a good idea. Yeah. As annoying as they are. It's a code. It is? Oh. Without yeah. rocks in yeah. front of them. Any <laughs> questions? Hey, Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, okay, I'm so sure I was I there more. in the parking lot. Can you tell me with this floor plan, where are the. I can see that there's an apartment where that large wall is. That's an apartment building right in there. Where are the other residents in that area? Uh, so uh, there are a few residential uh, units in this mixed use zone. Um, there are a couple that are north on the same side of the street. Um, could you, could you bring up, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you in your thought. There was a graphic there that showed the parking lot and, and the, where the Villar is. Looking up the hill? Looking up the hill. Right mm. Yeah. So that wall that's right there to the right-hand side, is that, that's an apartment, oh, no, over here, that one, that's an apartment building. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And the residents, are they residents all the way to the street, or is it just residential in the back? It would appear from the, from the frontage that they are also toward the front. So that's a, the whole, the that's whole complex is an apartment building. Yeah. Okay. And is there an apartment, so the other side of the street, the hotel, oh. and then the condo. Is that a condo? Yeah. Okay. Off that's to the left? Okay. Straight ahead what here in the in, toward on the other side of Avenida Estrella. Yeah, there's it looks like a con I can see the hotel and also to looks the left, like there might be like, an like office condo, there. office condo, a mi maybe a mixed use. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Okay, so tell me that amplified music is not going to directly affect that apartment building that's right there attached to the parking lot there. 
to tell you the truth, I never even knew there was a parking lot there. Mm. It must be always full. But so that wall there, so is it staff's opinion that Amplify music would not disturb the residents there? It's very close. It's a very tiny parking lot. Well, st uh, staff is reviewing this project against uh, precedents of previous conditions of approval, which uh, city staff has uh, experience enforcing, uh, and against the regulations of the um, zoning ordinance, uh, policies of the general plan, and other city documents. Uh, I, I want to... I don't want to say that staff has a um, an opinion because we're we're doing an analysis based on fact. Right, yeah, you're yeah. basing on previous conditions. Um, this project, as proposed and as um, the conditions of approval uh, recommended that are included in in the uh, draft resolution before you, includes similar. Um, uh, similar requirements to address noise and and mitigate potential impacts from that noise and staff is comfortable with the requirements that are contained in those conditions to address issues if they do arise um, mm -hmm. as a mixed use zone uh, I you know I, I, I can tell you that we we have gotten complaints um, uh, about uh, Restaurants that have live entertainment, other businesses that have live entertainment or amplified sound. Um, so it's it, there's always there's always a um, a delicate balance between uh, residential uses and uh, commercial uses in such close proximity. Right, that that's a challenge. I yeah. agree, and I know that housing is at a premium. In, as far as trying to find an apartment building or a place to live once you've moved in. It's not like you can just pick up and move because we don't have that much availability. And I, I'm just trying to, to, to make sure that everybody's a good neighbor here so that the residents aren't disturbed and that we have a beautiful new business also joining us. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to, to hear more from the public. And then what, what, what is the city's thoughts on mixed use? And I mean, how... Yeah. When you live above a business or a restaurant and you chose to live, th I mean, can you walk me down that, like, I don't know, it's a hard, it's a hard balance. You know, how, how do you not have a restaurant with some entertainment and live above it when we're being required to provide more housing or, you know, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to strike a balance perfectly. I, I don't know how to. I don't know staff's response to that, but uh, and we could certainly you know discuss it more during discussion. Yeah. But you know I agree. Like if you someone chooses to live in that type of location with a certain intensity of use adjacent, you can expect higher. You know you can't expect library conditions all the time, in my opinion. Yeah, and, it, and just because it was asked of staff, that are you know my opinion on it, if it, if there was one, is that yes, it comes down to pr preference. You know, uh, folks are renting or purchasing property in an area known to be an entertainment spot of sorts, um, and it should be noted for the record too that there are uh, several businesses in the immediate vicinity that do have amplified live entertainment, as Adam noted, um, specifically Duke's, uh, Goody's Tavern, and Ole's Tavern are all in that general vicinity, real close to those. Um, Existing uh, residences. So. I think we need to have the applicant, you know, come up, and discuss well, what the what it's all likely. about, what kind of what kind of music, you know, they think they're going to play, because there's a lot to do with the owner or the applicant of what their ideas of their venue. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they're going to play acid rock, you know, every day of the month, they might be running into trouble if they don't keep the doors closed. If it's sort of smooth music that you can eat and drink, then I don't think we have a problem. It could just be a piano player. So uh, we could talk forever. Right. Let's hear what... Okay, no, we will. But it also depends on volume. <laughs> yeah, piano music at the wrong to, volume would it be... It has to go by the city noise code. Right, so, I agree. And we have enforceability. Do we have any other questions for staff at this point? Um, this I have a couple. Um, will this 
projects be, and uh, forgive me, I've forgotten the term. So we have some exterior dining right in the patio area, 300 square feet. Will it be eligible for additional exterior dining beyond that based on the semi-recently adopted exterior codes that we did like down Del Mar and everywhere? Like can it take over, can it instantly take over more parking spaces and or some parking on El Camino Real based on those, I forget what we called it. Yes, uh, it's the city's parklet program. Parklet, yeah, thank yes. you. Um, the parklet program where uh, businesses are allowed to construct decks in the public right of way, those apply to Del Mar um, uh, and down into the Pier Bowl uh, uh, along Victoria. <clears throat> I, I don't believe that we have that in place along El Camino Real, so that would not be a possibility. And uh, on uh, outs, outside of the public right of way, if they were to, um, uh, uh, if, they, if there was a desire for the, uh, to provide more outdoor seating, it would trigger more of a parking requirement, um, which they are, are not going to be able to provide additional parking, and that would be a limiting factor to additional outside seating. Okay, but but they are allowed to per four dot eleven, they are allowed to, you know, get a shared parking agreement with any other lot within three hundred feet, so they could conceivably do that, right? They could, but uh, the project before you is uh, memorializing, or should it be approved, would memorialize a parking uh, requirement that only provides the amount of parking that the proposed use requires. If they wanted to provide additional outdoor seating, they would need additional parking and that would have to come back through a discretionary permit process for another approval of a shared parking agreement. I have a comment. Okay. I thought I read in there that the patio did not require any parking spaces. Uh, that 16 seats. Yes, restaurants between. Uh, oh, up to 16 <laughs> seats? Restaurant. There's, it's not, it, that's not a universal, but in this particular instance, they can have up to 16 exterior seats without triggering additional parking. More than 16 seats is going to start requiring the same amount of parking that's required for indoor seats. Okay, thanks. A um, couple other things. On 4.11, um, talks about a shared parking agreement. Um, is it... Is it firm? I didn't quite read it as being firm relative to that. You know, they need to provide all the required parking during, of course, the length of the, the period that the restaurant is open. Mm -hmm. So is that uh, quite a well written into the conditions? I didn't necessarily read it that way as being a requirement. Uh, just so that we're on the same page, a shared parking, the condition that you're referencing states a shared parking agreement between the subject property owner and the owner of an adjacent property within 300 feet of the subject property for the exclusive use of nine offsite parking spaces during the hours of uh, the businesses in an operation. Um, in this case, the, the, there are two lots uh, that make up what we're what we're seeing as the property, um, one lot that has the building on it, and another lot to the to the right that essentially has like two two or three of the, um, the parking stalls along El Camino Real, and then it just goes straight back. That lot is owned; those two lots are owned by the same individual. I understand? Yeah, and so that's going to be the likely. Okay, so but the it, is it explicit enough that this has to has to the shared parking agreement has to be in place for however long of a duration the restaurant is in business. Like the parking agreement can't sunset mm -hmm. and the restaurant continues on. Is that is that sufficiently clear? That's a question for the city attorney. I don't need an immediate answer. If you need to read it, you can get back to me later in the hearing. My other question is, um, this is a CUP and a minor cultural heritage permit. What aspects of this are the um, 
MCHP. I didn't really hear much discussion about that. So the project is within the architectural overlay, which requires the minor architectural, uh, minor cultural heritage permit. Uh, for this particular project, uh, because it's exterior modifications to the building uh, only, which include uh, stucco and windows uh, and, and different treatments of that sort, um, that, that it, that's, the, that's in, in essence the uh, city planner has the determination uh, to, to approve the minor cultural heritage permit. Um, you didn't have to go to design review per se, but I think I'm getting that mixed up. But um, it's a it's considered a minor modification, but it's in the architectural overlay, which is the reason the permit's required. Okay, thank you. I have no other questions. Does staff? I mean, does the, Jenna? Do you have something? No, do you want me to respond to your sure. question? I I believe it is explicit enough, and I imagine um, I can de defer to staff that this is similar to. Um, conditions that we have put in other um, conditions of approval. However, obviously, if th there is a concern and uh, the commission can direct staff and to modify this um, if necessary, okay. if you see fit. Thanks. Does the commission have any other questions before we receive public input? Can you, can, Microphone. Can you explain where the wrought iron is and how that's going to look, the elevation? What's going around the patio? Sure. Well, that's that's where the decorative wrought iron is actually proposed. Let me get to that uh, elevation here. It's here at this location, yeah. where the outdoor patio um, is. Uh -huh. So the outdoor patio is under a roof. It's a it's a covered outdoor patio. Yeah. Right. It's a covered it's a covered roof. Yes. I could, it's open I, air. Can I? Right, but it's it's got a lid on it. Can I jump in because that's currently an escrow office, right? Uh, it may be yes. Not, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I mean it's it's a building. Yeah. yeah. There's, you know, I mean look at my pictures here, but I believe there's uh, four walls there. No, there's windows. So essentially, are they just going to take out the uh, the windows and just put wrought iron there? Do you know what they're doing? Yeah, the idea there, uh, as I understand it from the applicant, is to create an open air feel for the patio area. Um, the wrought iron would be, uh, the detailed wrought iron would be in place at the location that's shown in the elevation here. Maybe um, we'll just have the applicant just walk us through that sure. actual plan there. I think that might be better. Okay. And then I, I was just thinking we could get some sound dampening if if, if it weren't wrought iron, but I haven't processed that all the way through because I didn't know where it was going, the wrought iron. Yeah, thanks. Um, but uh, so I was thinking if it's a wall, maybe that would, I don't know, in the future if it's an issue, maybe we could do something with that to help sound from getting out, you know, of that space if it becomes an issue. Are there any other questions for staff? Yeah. It's discussion. Okay. Okay, great. Um, we would now love to hear from the applicant and any other members of the public that wish to speak on this item, um, including maybe any written comments if there are any. Um, the applicant has 10 minutes. Is that accurate? Um, I assume the applicant wants to speak. Um, I don't know if you've already filled out a blue app speaker card. If you haven't, that's okay. Just please do it after and hand it in up here. Um, I would suggest that you address some of the questions that you've heard repetitively. Um, combined, you have 10 minutes, so if you have other people that you want to speak, just keep that in mind. All right. Well, uh, when the, a yellow light will come on when you have one minute remaining on your time. Okay. And please state your name. I am, my name's Ryan Winter. I'm the owner of uh, Drift Distillery. Um, we've been operating in San Clemente for since we sold our first bottle in 2017. Um, during COVID, we put a kitchen in, which has been pretty successful. Um, however, we are pretty limited on what we do up here. It's mainly manufacturing. Um, pedestrian friendly is what we're looking for. Um, the location up here is 21 and older due to all the, you know, we have a lot of stuff that can hurt people, kids. They don't watch their kids when they're there at the restaurant. So we're 21 older. Down here will be more of a family-style restaurant. 
So we'll be all ages, uh, operating 11 to 11, um, to address the music's type. No, we're not playing acid rock. We'll be doing, uh, I, I tell my staff we play three types of music in my distillery now. It's country, it's western, and it's reggae. Um, it's mood music, um, type of live music that we have done in the past is a couple acoustic guitars, um, usually classic rock and just kind of old style country stuff. Um, we're pretty different from the majority of the other businesses around here do amplified live music. Um, we're not going to be doing, you know, till 2 a.m. It's probably 10 o'clock, last call. We'll be a restaurant. Kids can be there. Um, if you want me to address some of the details on that elevation. So the wrought iron is basically, we are taking over that escrow. You know, the whole building is going to be taken over. That escrow was like an, looks like an addition that was added on. We're going to be just knocking those windows out. Um, so there's not a direct line into the restaurant where you can just walk in. Um, we are still working on our layouts and, and uh, bar, how it would work. Um, there may be a pass through to the, to the patio from the bar where people can order and sit down. Um, or if we have uh, wait staff, they can grab stuff from that side of the bar. Um, and then there'll be a little door opening from to access the restaurant. Um, other than that, uh, we made a couple minor changes since we were we last met with you guys. Um, we reset or set in the entrance a little bit. We added two big double doors, and uh, we have a railing that will match the similar style of the handrail on the front door. Um, wooden pergola. But uh, yeah, so this isn't a, an all-nighter kind of business. It's more of a family restaurant. We, we do predict doing a lot of food. Um, you know, having our uh, distillery down there is going to be mainly for uh, small batch stuff, not really a lot of production. Um, we'll do all our production up here and uh, do some little just one-offs, um, maybe collaborations with some breweries and stuff we'll do. We'll do. And if you guys have any questions for me. Okay, I'll lead us off. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for expanding. Uh, we're always looking for, you know, good business models to operate here in the city. Uh, I think we're just trying to work through some of the details. And one of the things I heard you mention that is helpful is the family orientation. Um, I think my concerns around the law amplified live entertainment mm -hmm. would be addressed if you you stayed at 10 o'clock if if you would agree to a condition to discontinue amplified live entertainment at 10 yeah. my concerns are going to be addressed okay uh, so is that is that something that you would be comfortable so, with yeah um, usually we'd like to I mean, where we're at now, I mean, if you stay open and you're still serving food and drinks, people are going to linger. So employees cost a lot of money. You know, we got to kind of coach customers like, hey, one last call. Can I get you anything else? Um, so usually th we, that, that shutting down would be a cue, wouldn't it? Yeah. So okay. that's kind of like, okay, last call. And then, you know, people can slowly make their way out. We don't like to kick people out, but we There had, you go. Yeah, so... So that would be great if you, that's amenable. The second question around just the live entertainment is, are you gonna have vendors or are you gonna have a sound system that you're supplying? We're, we're supplying, we're gonna, we're gonna do it right. We're gonna have, a, a, let me say professional musicians help design the interior and where speakers are. So to address, it's not gonna be a PA system on the stage, it's just gonna blast this way. It'll be, spe the whole uh, facility will be, uh, speakered up, which projects, and you don't have to play music at such a high, loud volume. You should be able to still talk and eat your dinner, but it would be nice to have uh, live music for that. Great. So, so no what, DJs, no nothing like that. Okay, that's actually actually very encouraging. And um, what, what I hear you saying, and I don't mean to be putting words in your mouth, so you help me. Mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to help make your case for you, but you're talking about gentle amplification with multiple smaller speakers kind of arrayed around the facility the idea that you're talking about is its ambiance it's meant to be 
supportive of that yes and allow for conversations at the table it's not we're focused on this entertainer and nobody's talking it's just this pure sound yeah it's just in the background so yeah and that's one of our biggest pet peeves of going to a place and it's so loud that you can't even have a yeah. conversation um, if it's done right with the right uh, acoustics uh, sound panelings throughout the ceiling and it can be done pretty perfect well. and you're going to supply it so that it will be a consistent sound every time this levels will be the same yeah we yeah. can control that good because one of the issues i think is when you get different vendors in and they come in with their own setup and it's different every time and yeah yeah so this is actually good very good um i want to switch gears away from the amplifi amplified okay but sound. let me just uh, i you, know someone had a question it was like three to five days in the special events thing yes so we're we're a distillery restaurant first but we would like to have the opportunity to once in a while play music and and have that there so it's not we're, we're not planning on being every weekend um every weeknight you know there's a lot of bands going on around town so um the special events thing too right now that could probably in there because we do have up here we do rent our space out to have wedding receptions and stuff like that but we don't we don't foresee us renting the facility out i mean it'd probably cost way too much for anybody to do that but um that was probably why we had special events in there because we do you know we'll do like retirement parties and stuff like that where we close it to the public and then we just it's invite only so okay so let's just recap that then and put a just a um, that into a box so what you're saying your special events are you may close to the public yes and have private events yes okay but you're not that is different than you suggesting you're going to have concerts or things yeah. of that nature no we're not doing ticketed events and stuff like that no. okay so miss chris maybe you're taking this down and maybe we can update our some of our conditions on that um Okay, so this is great clarifying. I'm glad you're talking about it. Commissioner Cosgrove, yeah. I don't mean to cut you off. I do want to, as long as we're on that subject, yep. um, I would like to bring to your attention condition of approval 7.17. Uh, this is a standard condition of approval. Uh, it's a little bit long, but it does discuss what is actually being approved here. And that is a distillery with a kitchen and live entertainment that is um, uh, provided at a stage. Anything that is outside of that scope is, is generally going to be considered a special activity and there are special activity permits that are required for that. That's a separate permitting process. S uh, some, some, sometimes uh, special activities permits can be approved administratively, but uh, more than two a year requires a uh, zoning administrator approval. Um, this is a standard condition that code compliance uh, has put into uh, many of these types of applications. Um, so it's not uh, it's not necessarily precluding every everything that Mr. Winter is discussing, but um, an event that would be like renting out the entire facility for a wedding is not part is not part of a conditional use permit for a distillery and kitchen so just warning on that okay so that doesn't apply to the three to five times no the the, the amplified the sound is yes is, is going to be um, handled under the conditional use permit um, one are there any um, conditions of approval that are in this package that you are uncomfortable with uh, not so far. Um, okay. Yeah. Very good. I mean, I'm, I'm, we're, we're trying to create an experience. Um, you know, we're a distillery first, and um, we do some really good barbecue. Oh, do I need to stop talking? No, no, no. No, we're, uh, no, <laughs> we're asking questions. We your your time is unlimited as long as we're keeping okay. you up here. And your recipes are great. Thank you. Uh, well, I've they're my there. wife's. <laughs> good job. For whiskey or food? Uh, Both. Uh, yeah. do, well, they, they go together. <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, I don't, I don't. I haven't read anything in there. Um, you know, we're we're um, pretty easy going, and we understand the the sensitivity of the area and our neighbors. Um, 
you know, the older I get, I, I get a little more grumpier and don't like loud music at night. So, um, you know, that's one of those things why we know that there's a lot of noise in that area for sure. And, you know, we're not there till 2 a.m. You got JD's DJ in and, and it's just loud. And that's, those people can go there, like leave our place, go there and finish the night. I just have a couple more if I could, it's all right if you guys, if I just keep going. Um, the parking, and then I want to pivot a little bit to your, uh, to your patio, but let's just, the parking's quick. You, you're going to have about 10 employees, is it? Is that about, okay. um, is that about right? Probably around there, a couple in the kitchen, some wait staff, a couple bartenders, yeah, for How, sure. Where are you going to instruct them to park? Not on our parking lot. Okay. You're on your own, get here on time, but don't park here. Yep. Okay. Yep. Those are for our customers. Okay. <laughs> Great. Can you walk us through the outdoor dining experience uh, it's really with respect to the structure and i don't know chris if you can well that 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 elevation is excellent so walk us through that because i'm familiar with you know there's that escrow building and then there's a kind of a pony wall but it's really a wrought iron pony wall kind of corral right outside yeah. of it so um but, that where the where the uh that corral outside patio yep yeah, yeah. That is where our waiting area, so from our meeting we had previously, we talked about a place where people could gather, so we would yes. do a cover uh, pergola over that, um, and then people could wait, and uh, there's a space for them to hang out. That's where the bench, just the to- The benches, yeah. So that's where the bench is. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, the patio, I, I would say it's more, it's covered, but um, if, if you've been to like MRK, um, down in south, southwest San Clemente, they have an outdoor space, it's fully covered, but it's open. Mm -hmm. um, they do have shades that'll come down, and, and we plan on having to keep things, you know, some of the homeless out of there at night. We'll have uh, probably some curtains, security curtains that come down at night. So basically, you're just going to take that existing structure, remove the windows that are there. Yep. And then ha that's your open air ex at that, that point. Yeah. So there's a, there's a corner two windows, or front window, and then that window on the sides, you're seeing those. And then... The back window is it was actually a door. It's a door, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to just take that whole thing out. Um, that'll be an emergency exit uh, gate. Okay. There. Gotcha. So you're going to basically keep that structure. Uh, you're just going to modify the the window openings. Is there going to be a bar there, or, or, or what, so, it looks like a wrought iron? I can't tell what that. So we have so, we have a yeah the well the ABC requires us to have a certain height. Uh, yeah. So we went with you know the Spanish uh, village by the sea kind of wrought iron style that we would see, okay. and we would use that as a gate. Um, there will be a bar pass through window from there. Um, we're still working on how big that looks, but for people to actually can get up and walk to the bar and, and grab a drink, or our wait staff, because there'll be one door that's um, more in the back that w people will come in, they'll have to be walk around and sat in around there. And um, that's where the 16 people outside will. Are you, are you gonna close off on the front? You got the windows on the front of it, but around to the side, there's an opening as well where the corral is. Is that, you're gonna close that off or is that gonna be open as well? That's gonna be open. Okay. And then have you thought about the, um, at, and not, it won't be as an issue in summer, but somewhat. But for sure in the wintertime when it gets dark early, the way this parking lot is structured, you know, when people come in and they, especially when they pull out and exit yeah. on the lower lot, their headlights are going to go directly into that open patio area. I mean, that's just where the drive aisle is. Yeah. Have you thought about the glare and the lighting of that on the um, paint of your guests? Not really. I would, I would probably address that if we started getting complaints. Okay. Um, if they were like, hey, the lights are, too, you know, it's one of those things where if we do have a security screen that we could lower, that would maybe reduce that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'd probably address that if we got some complaints. Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you is... Uh, in the conditions of approval state that you're going to have two security guards or personnel. Is that, am I understanding that correct? Are you aware of um, that? I don't, 
I didn't hear we had two security personnel. I thought I read that somewhere, and I might be it's mistaken. It's in there. No, it's in there. Yeah. It's in there. If we... Yeah. Yeah. Does he need that in the CUP? Because that kind of... I don't even get that. Um, that might be a typo, but I, I if if we had a, a let's say a band and yeah, we would definitely have someone at the door, making sure we don't get too controlled. So we probably would have some security there. But um, on a day to day basis, it's it's really just a restaurant, you know, and uh, it's kind of like walking into your Beach Fire or your H H Cottons. And this is why I'm wanting to bring it up yeah. because. We read a report at you know at home, yeah, and you get an image of something when you read it. And quite honestly, with the amplified live music, the way it's permitted here, the mention of security, it it really gave me a different impression than what you're giving. Yeah. So I don't mean to I don't mean to be repeating you, but I'd want to make sure we are all clear. Yep. That your live entertainment is really ambiance music, it's gentle amplifications. You're not gonna be advertising bands. You're not gonna be trying to attract people to come listen to a particular group. It's just there to enjoy, to add to the experience of the dining. Can I interrupt you for a sec? Yeah. What he does, you know, he might sell the restaurant in a, in a month to someone else that likes acid rock. So, yeah. so the entitlement that we give him it falls you know, with and, the land. I get it. And, and so, so you know, you're painting a okay. pastoral picture of gentle coastal right. country western vibes, but that might change. But then the teeth of the conditions of approval is where we can come in. So, so we need to leave it the way it is. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The one thing I'm going to recommend when it comes to the motions is if we do change the live entertainment to 10 p.m., it stops at 10 p.m. That would be the one thing that I'm going to recommend. Because he said he was fine with it, so I think that would help a lot. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for the applicant? The two openings that look like, are they windows or are they open? Because this talks about sound something. Yeah. So is it glass or is that open? No, that's open. Open? Those are open, but it's not a direct route to the actual restaurant area. Right. Well, is there windows between the bar and that exterior patio then? So there'll be one. We're, we're, we're considering a pass-through. Um, we're still working on the actual size of that. Right. So so how will that, how will you close that at night? With like a metal security door that will roll down? Yeah, you, they, they make like little, uh, almost like little mini garage doors where you can just put down and, and close okay. it. Yeah, because on this thing it says all legend. So from from my understanding from the designer that or architect that was working on that, so where the the yellow box is, that and the bathroom, that's all insulated and and uh See right there, that little open space and the open space at the front, those all say sound insulation. No, those aren't sound. Yeah, so you don't have to. Is it on the? All right, I don't have a problem with it, just that your bar, the bar window is going to be, if that's truly open, and the bar window, because everything else is solid, the back is blocked. Those are the only two places where sound is. On the escape. legend, there's a, it's like a stippling, but it's hard to see at this scale. I think they're looking at the... No, the restaurant. new ones he handed out. It, read under wall legend. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. Yeah, but it says new 3 and 3 eighths. Three five eight with eight sound eight. insulation. Yeah, that's over at the restaurant. That's where that wall is. Well, but there's no legend line for... If you say, hey, there's no stippling in there, there's, no. there's none without with opening. It doesn't say glass. Whatever. Yeah. Like, isn't this a window here? This is a window here. Okay. Does anybody else? I, Go ahead. I'm, I'm comfortable with the sure. sound plan because we have every tool to go back in there and shut either them or whoever has the building in the future down. I am too. Um, does anybody else have any questions for the applicant? What's that? Oh, that is. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. We might need, to have him come back. We might need you to come back. Right. Thank you. 
Is there anyone else from the applicant or the members of the public that wish to speak? Okay. Seeing none, do we close the public hearing now, Jenna? Or do, for discussion? If you think you're going discussion? to have more questions for either, um, or for the applicant, I would not close the public hearing yet. Um, but if you want to move on to discussion, you would close the public hearing. Okay. You well, I want to move on to discussion, but we might want to bring them back up. You can reopen it. Okay. At that time. We hereby close the public hearing. Commission discussion. Um, I've pretty much gone through this whole project, and one, I want to say Design Review did a good job. Who's not able to attend that meeting, but uh, your comments were good. I wish we'd been able to um, go more Spanish colonial revival, but I don't think there's a nexus in requiring that um, on this particular project, so that's, that's fine. Um, I think the conditions of approval um, behoove the applicant to um, make sure he doesn't exceed the sound limits because if he's going to invest in the sound system, he's not going to want to waste his money and not be able to use it. Um, so I think it's conditioned pretty well for that. Um, uh, architecturally, um, I think it's an improvement, um, certainly for that, that corner of the building. Um, the parking is uh, conditioned, I think, where it will, um, I think the attorney also mentioned that I think that that's all done appropriately, so I think I can actually support the project um, as designated, but um, be aware as an applicant that uh, the public gets very sensitized to noise um, and it can be a tough nut to deal with. So uh, uh, be cautious and, and err on the quiet side whenever possible. Thank you. Anyone else? Steve? Yeah, I just want to thank you guys for um, addressing some of the comments that we had on the DSR, DRSC. Um, I don't know if any of you guys looked at the previous submittal, but they weren't proposing much. And really our main concern was this, you know, enhancement of the pedestrian experience, which I think you guys have accommodated um, in that corner. It's still gonna be a little bit tight, I think, getting in the main entry, but certainly, you know, recessing those doors and so having this sort of pergola with the open air as you enter I think is going to be helpful um, the seating uh, place for people to kind of wait um, because hopefully we're hoping that you're going to be really popular um, I think that's a big benefit I think it's there's a trellis I don't know if you guys remember but there's a trellis that starts further um, further I guess it'd be north I mean north you mean the on the building roof thing well it's a trellis yeah mm -hmm. they call it a permit nice. um, so we specifically requested that they tie into that um, architecturally which I think they did a pretty good job um, of doing that and it sounds like especially with the 10 I like the idea of the 10 p.m. Uh, shutdown on the on the music the amplified music um, I think you guys are at a point now where I would certainly support support the project and wish you uh, great success at that location. Thanks. Yeah, looking, I, I'm reviewing uh, all the other businesses and uh, their addresses and their hours, and it seems that 10 o'clock would be appropriate for this type of venue based on everybody else and kind of what's going on there. There's only, um, I think it's South of Nix is open uh, till 11 o'clock as far as amplified music um, permits but they're I don't think they're close to uh, residential like like we are here they don't even have it hmm oh that's hours of operation so anyway I think it's a great idea yeah I just Cameron yeah I just want to thank you for taking the suggestions to heart and making a very nice project I think it's a big upgrade for that area 
and it's going to look great, and you're going to have a lot of hopefully success. And so I, I, and I can make all the required findings as well. And I think what I'll be suggesting is just that we uh, uh, restrict the just the live amplified entertainment to ten, not the hours of the restaurant, just the live entertainment. That would be it for me. Thank you. So we're coming down with this 10 p.m. thing of the micro microphone. Oh, sorry. You can use that. I'm having a hard time understanding why we're penalizing him for an hour, because what what's Duke's restriction? We don't know. What's Goody's restriction? Okay, and there and Goody's is close. What's Oli's tavern restriction? And he's just ten numbers down the street. Matter of fact, on the same side. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're penalizing him if he's yeah, agreed he, to it. We're taking ten. We're taking ten instead of eleven. Staff has recommended eleven. Yeah, but if he Why didn't we agree to him it for an hour, if he didn't well, of agree course to he, it, he wants the he wants us to approve it. I think it's kind of silly that we're taking off an hour. We should give it back to him. I like the design. Parking, I think, is going to be fine except Sunday, because the church a lot of you know there's not enough parking for the Presbyterian Church. Um, so it's on the street, but they're going to have plenty of parking up top. Um, if you look at something like Sunny's. I didn't even plan to park in that parking lot. You already know that you've got to go up to Australia or find some other, so it's kind of ridiculous to keep, you know, his is better than Sonny's. Sound, uh, my only concern is the bar the bar window, and I think we should give it till 11. You know, the hours, I can't see why we're pinching off an hour. It seems kind of silly, when probably some of these taverns go till two. So I don't think I have the data to pinch off an hour. My only concern is the other taverns are not up against a residential. Well, one is just 10 numbers down. But they still doesn't have an apartment building next to it. I know, but he's also down, and the residents on the one side to the right, mm -hmm. that's a solid block wall. If they're, so they're really, and are they not, on top? It's not going to be loud. I just don't I'm, understand I'm why we're cutting off an hour. I'm comfortable with 10. Music, yeah, yeah, I think because yeah, the entitlement runs with the land, and as... Our chairman mentioned he, if this gets sold at five years from now or something else. Yeah, but what does one hour? Tent. What does one hour cutoff mean? It's yeah, that's right. It's more respectful to the neighbors. Bedtime for me is like around but eight. Do, so put that on the other people. <laughs> so they're not is here, reasonable. and those are before us. We, do, you know, if they were if they were before us, I would have, but they're not, so we can't. Well, I think but it's kinda... there's plenty of complaints about that, the DJ and everything else. I think we're trying to do a better job now. They're within 50 feet. But why should he suffer for others? He's not suffering. He's agreed yeah, to it. In, you're restricting him for another hour or maybe more. No. If others can go till 2. I don't think that till 2 makes it right. It's not right. I think it's too late and it's too loud. Well, but well, that's not before us. I could, I could jump in maybe a little compromise in that way because I, I understand both points. Um, maybe we uh, consider a Friday, Saturday till 11. And uh, midweek till 10. There's there's other places that seem to change their hours on Friday and Saturday night. And uh, maybe maybe we could hear from the applicant one more time and feel his real opinion on that. I want to know what he thinks. We want something that can be enforceable. What's that? We want it to be enforceable. Well, it, is by the well, it, it, it has a noise ordinance. It is by the noise ordinance. So we have that after 11 o'clock on Friday, I Saturday. I just don't understand the one hour. I, here's the thing. Do? Here's the thing. A couple, couple points. Number one, he wants to wind his business down and close at 11, and having the, the, the live entertainment shut down at 10 helps him do that. Number two, the, if you have ever called code enforcement or our sheriff's department about noise, I challenge you to tell me when they've responded in a timely manner. They don't. Number two, number three, there are apartments within 50 feet of this building where you're going to have an open air area. 50 feet. 50 feet. Um, you also have a very large condominium complex about 100 feet to the rear. That sound's going to hit that block wall and bounce, go right up that hill. I think he's, the way he's going to operate is going to be great. But... To the point made earlier, the, per, the entitlement runs with the property, so I think this is a good, responsible thing to do for that particular site. So that's why I'm supportive of it. And we're not changing his hours of operation. That would remain. 
It's just the hours of the amplified live entertainment of which he's indicated would actually help him uh, shut down by 11. Okay, we, un we understand that. I would like to reopen the public hearing and ask the applicant to address the sound issue. Um, I, I would try and say, if you can, not under the threat of not getting you know, a potential yeah. approval, but how you really feel yeah, about it, ten, 10 versus 11, and potentially Friday, Saturday night distinction over the other yes, nights. Yes, obviously we, don't, we would rather be not restricted, um, understood, like if we have people spending money, that's always a good thing. If we're 10 minutes over, you know, that, and if I'm getting a citation or if I'm getting a warning for being 10 minutes over, that, that's not good for me. Um, we would like to have the freedom to, to stay at 11, all, uh, you know, but it, realistically, we do last call. We make sure people are cleaning up, kitchen closes um, at 10. Um, we won't be serving food. It'll just be drinks then, and then last call at nine four or ten forty five, and then we kick people out. But it would be good to keep it as long as possible. Would I be willing to compromise? Yes, I would, um, because you know it's something that we need to do for our business. But um, that we would do prefer not to have those restrictions. But okay, thank you very much. Do you need any more? I don't think so. Okay. Um, Thank you for your candor. I'm closing the public hearing again. Well, let's, because we have the applicant speak again, just make sure there's no public comments. And I okay. know. Are I there any other public comments? <laughs> Maybe from the wife? <laughs> um, okay, seeing none, we'll close the public comments and hearing. Um, I'd like to weigh in on this. Um, and then I think we should just vote. Um, unless there's other things, because we can talk round and round in circles. Um, my opinion, um, I certainly hear what you're saying, Cameron, um, and I'm more sympathetic to Dr. McCacken's argument. I think there's teeth in the, yeah, if there's a, if there's a, a, a noise complaint or two on any given night, police aren't going to be out there in a timely manner. But if it's a repetitive problem, they're going to get in trouble and and code enforcement's going to come down on them and potentially you know under the threat of revoking the CUP maybe change the hours or whatever they have to comply with an ordinance the noise ordinance there's others that you know have amplified sound I'm comfortable with 11 my personal opinion and I'll be voting that way um, and and I certainly understand there's apartments right next door but to me to Commissioner Davis's point people that live there, you ought to have an expectation that it's not a library and that there's the potential for noise impact. So that's all I'd be voting. I'd love to hear from others, but I think we should get it to a vote pretty quick. Okay. I'd like to make one comment. We are talking a mixed use zone. This isn't a restaurant zone. This isn't anything else. This is mixed use. Um, we have to start thinking a little bit in the city that this is not going to be a unique situation. Um, there's going to be more housing on top of commercial. Um, this runs with the land forever. And if we have an applicant that's willing to do it at 10, I think that's certainly more compatible with a mixed use zone, which this is. Um, and they can still have acoustic music, am I correct? Uh, um, without that being specified in the uh, CUP up until 11. No, <clears throat> live entertainment and amplified sound are both. And amplified. Yes, are both. Because the um, they could, I assume, um, I don't know how you'd ever enforce it, let's not even go there, mm -hmm. um, shut the amps off at 10 and they could continue with acoustic. Um, if they chose, and they, that's something they could actually request later on. Is that correct? Yes, the applicants can uh, request amendments to this conditional use permit okay. in the future. So I, I think we need to start thinking land use. I, I agree with um, Scott very much that this goes with the land. Um, the properties next door, they could be mixed use um, at some point in time right next door. And uh, 
I think it would be prudent to 10 o'clock in mixed. I'd like to see that as a standard for mixed use, be perfectly mm -hmm. honest with you. Mm -hmm. But that's not a discussion for tonight. Um, so I'm in support of the 10 o'clock um, curfew on um, amplified um, and at some point having staff consider doing maybe something for the mixed use zone, a, a code amendment that says that's a standard for mixed use. Yeah, I can uh, just add to that. I think that what we're looking for is I know that what we're looking for is successful businesses all around mm -hmm. and successful housing projects. Um, I th we need to protect, I think, the integrity of those some of the projects that exist. And we're, we've already heard, I think, tonight that there have been some complaints at the hotel. Um, and this is going to be even closer uh, to that. So. We want these guys to be successful. We also want the hotel to continue to be successful and protect the right. You know, we also want people to move into these places mm -hmm. in a mixed use zone. And so I agree. I, I think that we, we put this restriction. They're willing, they, they would prefer not to have it, sure. But I think it's reasonable and they've indicated that they're okay with it. Um, I think it's our duty and responsibility to also consider the, the residential, not only that's already there, but that's going to be coming in, you know, close by. So I would support it with the 10 o'clock restriction. Because I went out and drove the, the property, it, it's obvious that those apartments are family, you know, they're, they're, they've got to go to work. And maybe they work on the weekend. Um, so I'm really comfortable with 10 o'clock. I'm uncomfortable with going past. Uh, and again, we're trying to encourage this mixed use because we're mandated to do so. And I'm trying to blend both. I want the business, and this is a beautiful business, and I also want people to feel comfortable you know, renting those, those apartments. Uh, and there should be quality of life. So I think it's reasonable at 10 o'clock. Okay, anybody else want to weigh in or I'm, I'm open to a motion? I'll make a motion. Um, so based on the information in the staff report, subject to the required findings and conditions of approval with the addition of a 10 o'clock limit on live amplified music, uh, I recommend that we adopt resolution PC 23-23. 011, which would, number one, determine the project is categorically exempt from the requirements of the CEQA pursuant to CEQA guidelines, section 15301, class one existing facilities. Number two, approve conditional use permit 22-370 and minor cultural heritage permit MCHP 23-116, drift distillery and kitchen Subject to the attached conditions of approval with the one addition that we mentioned. Second. 10 o'clock. Okay. Is there an alternate motion? No, because it would lose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm in favor of the project, but I just can't see chintzing away an hour. For, and it's not his reason we're chintzing it. So I'll vote in favor. Okay. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Passes 7 0. Congratulations. Please be sensitive on the noise, obviously. <laughs> and for the record, there is that 10 day uh, calendar day uh, appeal period. Thank you, and the record thanks you. And in, in fact, uh, just also for the record, the next city council meeting. Um, of July 4th has been canceled and so there is a City Council appeal period which normally falls in right around that 10-day appeal period so um, that will not be up until July 19th July 18th I think is the next meeting okay thank you um, I see no new business 
No old business. Reports from commissioners and staff. Do we have any comments from the commissioners? No. Um, tentative future agenda. I see we have a study session on July 19th with Trackit. Is that on? Adam, do you know? Uh, tentatively, that is. We're um, we are still waiting for some features uh, to be uh, uh, rolled out. Uh, planning division staff is not in charge of all of that work, and so we're waiting on on some others to uh, to get this going. We'd rather wait for the entire user interface um, uh, to be available um, uh, rather than piecemealing it into two sections, just doing one one presentation on it. So it it may not be ready by then, but I will. Well, I will keep you updated. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other items, I will adjourn the meeting to uh, next meeting of the Planning Commission Wednesday, July 19th at 6 p.m. in these chambers. <laughs>